The data structure that we are going to discuss today has so many applications in so many real systems. We are going to talk about a lot of applications and a lot of high level system designs that you must have heard of. And this is going to be very interesting if you are interested in either high level system design or in data structures. If you have not heard of bloom filters before this, then it might sound a bit scary, but trust me, it is very easy and looking at so many applications, you're going to be really intrigued. So let's get started. For understanding, let's start with a very simple and basic use case. Recently, I started Educoses and I wanted to create a new mail ID for it. I searched for educoses at the rate gmail.com. Now that was not available, so I had to create connect with educoses at the rate gmail.com. How much time do you think this process would have taken? If you think about it, the request would have gone to backend and there must have been how many mail IDs already? Billions of mail IDs, right? So what email service would have had to do? It would have had to check billions of mail IDs and see whether educoses at the rate gmail.com is present or not. Now that was present. So I said another request is connect with educoses at the rate gmail.com present or not. Imagine going through billions of strings and seeing is this user ID or is this mail ID available or not. Now this is a very common use case and we are going to talk about a lot of applications. But the basic problem, if we have to understand it in a very simple way, it is that you, you have like billions and billions of strings and you have to see whether a new particular string is present in this set of strings that you have or not. Now that is the use case that we are going to solve. Before we move ahead, I would just like to take a moment away here and remind you that the second batch of live HLD course is starting on 16 January. Uh, the testimonials of the previous batch, the week-wise curriculum, the detailed FAQ, everything is present over there. On the site, the link is in the description. It's called educoses.com. Please do check it out. We are working really, really hard towards it. And we are adding more services as well. We have started with mock interviews and we have so many amazing things in pipeline. And all of that will just keep adding up. We are trying to deliver much more than what we commit. And you can check out everything. I'm not going to talk much about it. The testimonials, everything, the curriculum, everything is mentioned over there. The notes are there, there are quizzes. Uh, our community support is there in the Discord and I have done a bunch of videos with my students of HLD on the channel. I am linking that as well. You can check that out as well. If you're interested to attend live classes, please do sign up because always once the live classes are over, I get a bunch of messages that I want to attend live. Well, you can access the recordings anytime, but the fun of live is in itself. So if possible, please sign up before the live classes start. And Let's continue now. As you must have guessed that going through all the strings is obviously not an efficient solution. Uh, the time complexity is going to be order of n and we have billions of strings. And obviously it is going to be even more complex when we have distributed data because there's obviously so much data. The data is also present all over the world and all of that is also there. So how are you going to do it? Now I know a bunch of you must be thinking of say binary search, it will become order of login, but I hope you can understand that even that is not an efficient solution for such a common problem. Then you must be thinking of hash tables because that is going to give you an order of one, correct? But what about collisions and hashes? In worst case, even that becomes order of n, even if you use tries not enough efficient, right? That is where bloom filters come into picture. Now, if bloom filters sound very complex, let me tell you that it is in fact nothing but a simple array of bits. And it is very simple to understand it. So let's quickly take an example and let's see what is a bloom filter, how does it work and how does it solve our problem? As I said, bloom filter is just an array of bits. So I have made an array over here. I have made it of the size 10 plus one, which is 11. You can take it of any size and we'll discuss it at how do we choose the size. But for now, what we are going to do is once I've initialized the array with bit zero everywhere, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to visit this strings one by one. I am basically adding them to the visited set or you can say that I am adding membership to the strings or however you want to see it. Basically, I'm visiting them. So every time I visit a string, I'm visiting edu, co and sys, which are three strings in this case. What I'm doing is that I'm taking two hash functions. Now, what is a hash function? Basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to hash this string to one of these integers. So the integer can be 0, 2, 10, any integer, and I'm going to hash it. And obviously, hashing is going to make sure that every time I hash edu or co or sys using the same hash function, obviously, it should always give me the same answer, correct? So for now, for understanding purposes, let's say, Ki when we hash edu using hash function 1 and hash function 2, it gives me the results, say, 3 and 7. So now as soon as I visit this, what am I going to do is I'm going to visit this third index and going to mark it as one. 
Similarly, I'm going to visit this seventh index and going to mark it as one. Okay, basically, as soon as I visit edu, whatever the hash functions resulted in, I'm going to mark that index as one. And just as we can decide the uh, length of the array, we can also decide the number of the hash functions. We'll discuss that also. This is just for understanding purposes that I have taken the length as 11 and two hash functions. And I'm just saying that edu is using some hash function one and two, and it is generating the numbers three and seven. Similarly, say when we hash co using hash one, say it generates say four and suppose nine, okay? So I'm putting the four as one and the ninth one as none, as one. Similarly, I'm going to hash these strings as well. Suppose it generates the numbers say one and 10. So I'm going to put the one as one and 10th index also as one. So this is how our bloom filters look presently. What we were doing till now was visiting the strings and adding the values to the bloom filter or to the bit array. Here when I visited co, what happened? I put, I saw the indexes 4 and 9 and I put them as 1. Now suppose I have added the strings. I want to check whether co string is present or not. Okay, I'm going to hash it again using the same hash functions because we are using the same hash function as the same string. So obviously it's going to generate the same index, right? So I get the indexes 4 and 9. So I obviously go to ch uh, check four and nine. If both of them are one, if both of them are one, then I know that yeah, co may be present, correct? Now, why am I saying that it may be present? Okay, I am saying it may be present. It is not sure that it will be present. And let's understand with that uh, one more extension to the same example. Let's take two more strings. I have added two more strings now, literate and store, which is my another venture whose hoodie I am wearing, but okay. So now we are going to check whether literate and store are already visited or are they our members or have we added them to our set? Basically, we want to see have we visited literate and store strings or not. In reality, we have not, right? These were the only strings that we visited. Now, suppose we hash literate using these two hash functions and it suppose generates the values say 0 and 6. So 0 and 6. So what I'm going to do is check what are the values and indexes 0 and 6. So the values are index 0 and 6 is 0, 0 only, right? It is 0, 0 only. So obviously it has not been visited. Let's say it generated the values say 0 and 7, okay, 0 and 7. Even though 7 is visited, even though 7 is visited, it is marked 1, right? Because the, here it, the hash value was 7. So it is marked 1, but both the indexes must have been visited, right? Both the values should have been 1. So even if one of them is zero, then we are sure that we have not visited, right? So similarly, if there were more hash functions, even if one value is zero, that means we have not visited it because if we would have visited it, then we would have marked all the indices as one. Basically, if I would have visited literate, the value at indexes zero and seven would have been one, correct? Now, suppose I hash store. Now in store, suppose I get the values as four and suppose uh, 10. So now when I get the values 4 and 10, let's see. Now 4 is also marked as 1 and 10 is also marked as 1. It is giving me visited. It is giving me visited even though I have not visited it. Correct? That is why I was saying that maybe the string is present or not. This is the only important point to understand in Bloom filter. So listen very carefully and understand. Uh, let me repeat and explain to you once more. See, as we visit the strings, we hash them and values at both the indexes we are marking as one. So for edu, I have marked the indexes at three and seven, both of them as one. Similarly for co also, both four and nine is one. Similarly for literate, if I was putting it, I would have marked the values at both zero and seven as one. Here I have not put it, I have not visited this yet. Here I was just checking, is it there or not, correct? Now what happens is, ki when I check is co there or not, it is giving me hash values four and nine. So four and nine is there, correct? But even though the values at indexes 4 and 9 are 1, we cannot be absolutely sure that we have visited co, correct? Because here also store, we, get, we got the values 4 and 10 and we got it as that it is present even though it is not present. So what happened over here? This was a false positive. It gave us a positive answer even though we have not visited it yet. So this is called a false positive. Can we ever get a false negative? Can we ever get a false negative? Think about it. What is a false negative? Can I ever get the answer that 
a value is not present even though is it present can i ever can that ever happen no right why because what might happen is that at these hash at these indexes i must have added one at some other point right but i cannot get a false negative because if i have visited it definitely i'm going to get a one i can never say that the value is not present when it is present because if it would have been present i would have marked the indexes as one and the hash values would have given me the same indexes and i would have said ki it may be present so here we can get false positive sometimes i can say ki the value is present even though if it is not but i can never get a false negative i can never say that the value is not present even though it is present so that is the point to understand over here i get false positives but false negative is never possible that is why bloom filter is called space efficient probabilistic data structure let's break it down one by one why space efficient obviously as you must have guessed think about it taking billions of strings and storing that versus taking an array of bits for millions of data you might just require few mbs so obviously it is much more efficient than any other solution that you can think of hash tables tries anything else right so this is obviously space efficient and also over here very important point is to understand what will be the correct size of the array and what will be the correct number of the hash functions obviously right because we want to minimize the false positives so there are formulae for that and if you use the correct number of hash functions and the correct size depending on the the amount of data that you have the false positives is actually very less so obviously every high level system design is about trade offs right so what is the trade off over here if we understand it properly the trade off is memory versus efficiency here we might get a false positives never false negative but sometimes false positives that means i might sometimes tell you that a string is present even though it is not right in most of the scenarios where it is used is whether i have to see whether the string is already present or not so sometimes it is going to give me a false positive it is going to sometimes say that the value is present even though it is not versus the trade off is that i'm saving upon so much of memory right i don't have to store billions of strings maybe cache it this distributed data and all that i don't have to do any of that just few mbs is enough so obviously performance wise it is much better what will be the performance if you think about it so in order to add i just have to take the hash values right so suppose there are k hash functions so i have to do order of k and for each of those indexes i have to put the value as one similarly for searching as well right if the value is already there or not and for insertion it depends on the number of hash functions that you have obviously the performance is also much better so out of space efficient probabilistic data structure you have understood space efficient why probabilistic obviously we get false positives but never false negative so there is probability that's coming into picture in very simple terms if you have to understand whenever we get the answer as no it is a confirmed no it is a firm no versus when we get a yes answer it is always a maybe yes it is a maybe yes how good is the probability depends on the your size and the number of hash functions but it is still a probability but to say it in very simple terms if i ask you is a particular string present or not have we visited or not if the answer is no it is a firm no for sure we have not visited it but if the answer is yes then there is a probability in picture it may have been visited maybe there there might be like 90% chances then you should be checking again probably you should be going to your dp so we talked about the advantages of bloom filter it takes very less time the performance is good it is very space efficient and all of that what are the disadvantages one obviously disadvantage is that you have to find you need you have to decide the number of hash functions and the size of the array but other than that there is one more thing so obviously here if you noticed we have done only insertion and searching what about deletion what if i want to delete sys from my visited strings or what if i want to remove it from my memberships or something like that right so obviously if you remove it if you remove 1 and 10 then what you cannot remove 1 and 10 right because you might have had it at 10 10 from the store as well correct so you might end up having false negatives so deletion support is not there in this the good thing is that in most of the real applications which we are going to discuss right after this we do not need the deletion support and we are going to discuss that but there is also an extension of bloom filters which is called uh, counting bloom filters there this the support is there it is out of the scope of this video but uh, in general what it does is it approximates the number of times you have visited every single string so depending on that you get a more probable answer 
but we won't be discussing that and now let's come to the most interesting point which is understanding the applications in real systems you can really show off the knowledge of bloom filters in high level system design really there is a very common system design question which is web crawler and that is where bloom filters really come into picture if you do not know what web crawler is let me explain you it is also called spider spider bot or just a crawler or web crawler so essentially what we have to do is we have to go through all the billions of sites there that are there and we have to index the data and obviously this index data is used by search engines by data scientists and all of that but the point over here is that we have billions of urls and we have to go through the sites in web crawler what is going to happen is while processing or rendering a particular link there will obviously be links inside it and you will have to reiterate through the process and there are millions of links and obviously before reiterating and before visiting more and more sites because rendering or processing is obviously a uh, expensive process you should be checking whether you have visited the url already or not now there are billions of urls and you need to see whether you have visited the url or not which is the exact case of bloom filter and this is a very very common use case of bloom filter but obviously when we use bloom filters and systems like web crawlers we should know the nuances there is of course a possibility that even though we have not used, visited a url it might say that we have visited we might get a false positive so we have to call that out but we can balance this out again trade off and we have to discuss all of this in case in an interview or when you are designing you should know the trade offs bloom filters are also used a lot in databases for example we are using a no sql db where we are using lsm trees now in order to see, in order to find a key that does not exist in an lsm tree it can be very costly or expensive versus if we use bloom filter we could have just checked it over here and we could have gotten a firm no so if we are sure that it does not exist in db we are basically avoiding a very costly process we are reducing our disk reads and we are really making our db much more efficient content delivery networks like akamai or web browsers also use bloom filters to avoid caching one hit wonders now what are one hit wonders let me give an example suppose i am searching for something now because i am related to tech i am going to search a lot about coding right so it makes sense to cache the information right you might be using lru or something like that versus if i am searching for something like clothes or makeup i will be searching for it once in a while or some rare thing maybe i want to read about something in particular maybe about flats or cars or anything in particular that i search very rarely now every time i search something even once should you be adding that to cache if you think about it even once if i am searching for it even if i search for it only once in a while should you be adding it to cache no right you should be adding to cache something that i i search a lot right and what you search only once and then you are adding to cache basically is a one hit wonder so what we could do is that while i am searching for something you could use a bloom filter and you could see have i already visited the url or have i already searched for this particular thing or not and only if i have done it at least once you are going to cache it so this is where bloom filter is going to help us out it is going to maximize our cache hit and it is going to make the entire process of caching much more efficient so i hope you understood about bloom filters we talked about many applications what other applications can you think of or know of please do let me know in the comments and i hope you like the explanation if there are any other such topics that you would like me to cover please do let me know i have been feeling guilty about not being able to create a lot of tutorial content for youtube and that is never the case even though uh, educos is, is my baby literate store is my baby but i definitely want to provide a lot of free content as well on youtube so if you want me to cover any particular topic let me know please continue your support and love and thank you so much for all the love and support on educosis and on literate store and if you like my work please do subscribe please do share the channel with your friends uh, check out educosis check out literate store it would mean just so much to me i have no idea thank you see you next time